Hello, I'm Colin Powton from Monash University in Melbourne. Pleased to be with you today and I thank the organisers for the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about um, the delivery of mRNA and the background to the development of COVID vaccines. So the reason there's so much excitement about mRNA is that it has significant advantages from a pharmaceutical point of view. And I'm a pharmaceutical scientist, so I'm very aware of that. mRNA is produced by an enzymatic process. And that means that um, it's a relatively pure process. It can be purified using chromatographic methods. And that leads to much easier quality control and quality assurance issues for manufacture. So mRNA consists of a cap, a coding region that codes the gene of interest, some UTRs that are important for uh, gene expression, and very importantly, a long poly A tail of at least a thousand adenine bases. There is quite a lot of opportunity for improving the design of mRNA, although there has been a lot done, particularly by the companies involved in this technology, but it's still relatively young and therefore there's still scope for new opportunities, both in the design of the RNA, but certainly in the delivery of the RNA to different tissues. One of the key aspects of RNA that's important is the safety aspect. Really, there's almost no possibility of insertional mutagenesis. You really have to have a reverse transcriptase in the cell for that to happen. So it's a very, very rare event. It's obviously very rapid. And you've seen how rapidly the COVID vaccines were made. As soon as you have an idea of the genome sequence you want to express, it's very, very quick to get a candidate vaccine. Also um, very adaptable. So in the face of the variants that are arising with COVID, one of the most important things is that we can respond and and vaccinate against different variants and maybe even present a cocktail of mRNAs against different variants in one formulation. There are some other things to note about RNA and we've learned quite a bit about it since the COVID vaccines have been given to humans. And that is that there are other modalities than just native RNA. We can use a self-amplifying RNA and a couple of programs in COVID vaccines are using that technique. And we can also use chemically modified RNA, chemically modified using usually a, a substitute for a uridine, which I'll show you in a moment. So the chemically modified RNAs in the two vaccines that are approved, both contain this N-methyl pseudo-UTP in when the RNA is transcribed instead of using traditional UTP. And you can see that the pseudo UTP is an isosteric replacement for uridine, but it has a very significant effect in reducing the innate immune activation, which occurs with native RNA. You can also use this molecule, but the N methyl molecule has become the most important. And this comes from the work of Carico and Wiseman, and it's been adopted by both of the approved vaccines. You also need a cap. So um, the natural RNA is capped at the five prime end with this structure here. This is the cap one structure, where you have this um, methylated um, adenine and linked here within this cap one structure with three phosphate groups and this methylated, this O-methyl group in this position here. This is the, the most efficient cap that's available easily at the moment. And we use like the Pfizer-BioNTech product, the trial and clean cap reagent, which allows you to put this cap on during the in vitro transcription. So it's very convenient. Another thing that's important about the RNA itself is it must be pure. And this is something that Wiseman's group established some time ago. So here you can see one of the products we've made here. Um, here, purified RNA, 
here encapsulated in a lipid nanoparticle, which, as you know, most of the vaccines are, and here back extracted out again. So a very clean product, and you try to reduce the amount of structured or double-stranded RNA that's in the product as well. Normally that's done by chromatography or on a small scale, you can do it by extraction with cellulose. And then you use an antibody against double-stranded RNA to effectively probe how much double-stranded RNA there is in the product. So here's a dot plot of a standard double-stranded RNA, one nanogram, 25 nanograms, 50 nanograms on the blot. This is a product from a T7 polymerase reaction. So you can see there's quite a lot of structured or double-stranded RNA in the product. And after purification, you can get down to levels which are in the range of maybe 0.5 to 1% quite easily. And that's very important to uh, control and maybe reduce the innate immune activation. So this is one of the interesting things that we found during the vaccine program, that um, as vaccines have been used in humans, what was expected from the COVID-19 vaccines hasn't necessarily come to pass. So prior to COVID, it was generally thought that using native RNA was a pretty good option for vaccination because you need an innate immune, so you need some innate immune stimulation to get a good vaccine. And the other approach that was also quite strongly supported was self-amplifying RNA. We're using a, an alpha virus replicon to allow the RNA to be amplified in the cytoplasm of the target cell. So these programs are still in operation, but it's interesting that the one that's worked for Pfizer, for, Moder for Moderna and for BioNTech Pfizer is the use of the in methyl pseudouridine modified RNA. And many people might have said before COVID that whilst this was expected to work, that maybe it wouldn't be quite as good as these in that you wouldn't necessarily stimulate an innate immune reaction in the same way. But maybe this is the difference between mice and humans that actually it's turned out that the vaccines that have been most successful are the ones made with modified RNA. And as you probably know, the native RNA vaccine that CureVac put into phase three didn't reach the same levels of efficacy. And, and so we have to wait and see whether native RNA and self-amplifying RNA can be developed for COVID as we go forward. What about the formulation? Well, making a product can be broken down into these three steps. So make the DNA, DNA template, in vitro transcription to make the RNA, purify it. You can purify and freeze both of these steps, but the key thing which has made these vaccines work is to formulate it in such a way that's protected and is delivered to the appropriate sites. In this case, we think the most important thing is delivery of these lipid nanoparticles to lymphoid tissue and uptake by dendritic cells. So the formulation has been a critical step, and I'll talk a lot more about how that works. One of the issues that we have, though, in all of these vaccines is the very crowded IP landscape. And so you have to ask the question, do you have freedom to operate? Do you have to have a license from various manufacturers? Both the techniques used for the RNA manufacture and the formulation are protected by numerous patterns. On the other hand, the, there are ways of circumventing these patterns and there are also opportunities for development of new IP. And it's still a very, um, a very early stage technology. So one of the things that's quite important to recognize about the lipid nanoparticles is that they're not liposomes. So in order to make these particles, and this was a discovery really that came out of Vancouver labs, originating in Peter Kulis's lab, but then ultimately finding their way into various companies. And initially the, the, the development of the lipid nanoparticle formulation was made 
within the company Proteva from Vancouver by a couple of scientists who realized that if they switch their attention from a quaternary nitrogen lipid such as DOTAP to an equivalent lipid, one which had a tertiary amine, so the equivalent to DOTAP would be DODAP, that you can produce particles in a very different way to liposomes. And what you do is you make the particles at low pH. This is done by putting the nucleic acid in a buffer at pH four, but then mixing that with an ethanolic solution of lipids. And because you have a relatively acidic system, the amine remains protonated and that draws in the nucleic acid into the particulate form. But the key thing that's important is that you then raise the pH in the laboratory by dialysis or by tangential flow filtration in a manufacturing environment, you raise the pH to 7.4. And at that stage, these lipids are predominantly unprotonated. They have a pKa nominally of about 6.5. So there's a big change between pH 4 and pH 7.4. And the nucleic acid gets trapped in this particle, which is probably largely amorphous, uncharged lipid. So it's very different to a liposome. Most important thing to recognize. We don't really understand the structure inside these particles, exactly what form the nucleic acids or you know, shown here, maybe DNA is encapsulated in these particles but it's probably largely amorphous in the center. Clearly there's some water in there and there may even be some pegylated lipid in there as well. We don't fully understand the structure and that's an important topic for, for research. I'm just gonna point out that um, making vaccines using this kind of technology and even making self-amplifying vaccines from RNA goes back some time. So Novartis had a platform over 10 years ago, which generated some very interesting results using self-amplifying RNA. And this paper here in PNAS is an important one to look at. Just very briefly, without going into detail about this particular slide, you can see that you can get strong antibody responses for different um, groups of IgGs. This is uh, an RSV um, vaccine and compared, so unformulated, these are more or less the same, these three panels here, but for different um, subtypes of IgG, you can see that doses of un unformulated RNA versus lipid nanoparticle formulated RNA, you can see how much higher the antibody titers are and uh, antibody titers, which are quite respectable at levels of 0.1 microgram, maybe even 0.01 microgram using self-amplifying RNA. So this goes back quite a long way, this technology, and it was in an LMP type formulation. In fact, the only product that was actually approved as an LMP product prior to COVID was an siRNA product, which was launched on the market by Alnylam Pharmaceuticals and is on Patro, an siRNA, an siRNA treatment for a rare disease, HATTR. One of the things that you can see from this um, detail of how the compound is administered is that this is quite a reactogenic system. So in order to give this product intravenously, you have to pre-treat patients with corticosteroids, paracetamol, and antihistamines. That gives you an indication that this product does induce innate immune reactions, and therefore we expect that to happen in the vaccine setting as well. And as we know, that does happen. So controlling that in relation to the role of the RNA, but also the lipid nanoparticle is something which is a very important aspect of making these vaccines. So 
So a bit more detail on this issue of how the products are formulated. So the classical formulation, which was patented by Proteva, now owned by Arbutus Pharma, um, is a formulation that consists of this kind of mixture of four lipids. So an ionizable lipid, which could be doughed up, but now it's a somewhat different lipid I'll show you in a moment. Generally at around 50%, you can go lower. The Pfizer product has 45% of the ionizable lipid used in its product. But generally this formula is very consistently used around 50% ionizable lipid, around 10% of a natural helper lipid, which is normally a less thin derivative. It's often disterol phosphatidylcholine. There's usually a 38 or 40% cholesterol, and then a very small amount of a pegylated lipid. I've shown here DSP peg. It's not used in the COVID formulations. I'll show you the one that is in a moment, but this is a sort of classical formula. And that formula was patented and is a formula that has um, created a lot of issues around the IP of these lipid nanoparticles. It's a very long and convoluted story, which I don't want to go into in detail, but um, if anyone's interested in that, there's a, quite an interesting article on the history of this in Forbes magazine. Now, one, once those LNPs were first recognized as being interesting technology, there was a big push to make, to find different lipid materials. You can see here two papers, um, this one is from 2008, this from 20, 2010. Um, big groups working on screening exercises to find lipids. And these lipids have found their way into different products one way or another, or in, into programs within companies. This paper from the MIT group and Daniel Anderson is one of the, one of the leading scientists that has found Translate Bio. And here we can see the group which was related to the Vancouver group, but also Al Nylon working together in those days in 2010 to find alternative cationic lipids. So there's been a lot of effort to improve the LNP formulations over the years. What we now know, and this is uh, summarized very well in a um, review by Coolis and Hope, that review in 2017, is that um, by changing the nature of the first, uh, changing the nature of the ionizable lipid, you can improve the performance of these materials. So the series change from DODAP to these lipids over here, which are owned by Arbutus and now Genovase. This one is an important one. It was found in the OnPatra, it was used in the OnPatra product, DLN MC3 DMA. And most people regard this as the gold standard second generation lipid. It does have higher activity than DODAP. One of the reasons that it has higher activity, at least the theory, according to Peter Kulis in particular, is that it's optimized for its pKa. So you can see from um, this diagram here that in an sRNA experiment, factor seven knockdown was better when the pKa was in that 6.5 range. Either side of that, an ionizable lipid was not so effective at knockdown. And that seems to be something which has been consistently shown for these lipids that you need to have an appropriate pKa. The other thing that has been cited, again, by Coolis's group is the shape is important. So the theory is that the lipids that work best are cone shaped. They have a relatively small head group and the lipid tails occupy more bulk, and so they occupy a shape which is not so plain. It doesn't necessarily like forming bilayers, it forms more curved shapes. And this is thought to can interact as a positively charged material with negatively charged lipids in the membrane to cause disruption in the bilayer structure 
which may induce fusion and therefore endosome escape of material and, and enhance delivery. Where are we now? Well, now we have some lipids that are described as third generation lipids. And these are lipids, these are the lipids that are actually used in the approved vaccines. So this ionizable lipid used in the BioNTech Pfizer lipid is owned by Acuitas, as is the pegylated lipid that's used in that product. You can see that um, it's no longer a dialkyl lipid, it's a branched lipid with an ester functionality halfway down the alkyl chain. You can imagine that that maybe makes it more biodegradable, but also makes it more cone-shaped. And the head group is very small. The same is true of the Moderna lipid, but instead of having both tails branched, it has one branched and one linear, but with an ester functionality. And this contrasts with a lipid like DNMC3 DNA, which, is, which I said is a perhaps can be thought of as a, a gold standard second generation lipid, which has traditional two alkyl chains. But these are the sort of pegylated lipids that have been used in, in products. So these two in the COVID vaccines, this one in the Al Nylon on Patro product. Similar in nature, but subtly different in the head group. Well, there is scope for modification of these types of materials. And you can see here some studies that we've done by modifying the general formula of, um, of an LNP. So a standard LNP would have the formula such as the one I described, one of the original Proteva type formula, but we can modify that formula by changing the ratios of materials. And what you can see here is that um, by modifying the formula, we can move from something which, uh, this is a, an intravenous administration to mice of a reporter gene, and we're looking at luciferase activity measured by uh, relative light units. And if you look across from this formulation to this one over here, and just sort of gradually cast your eye on the various tissues here, you can see that much of the tissues have similar levels of gene expression from one formulation to another. But the spleen expression is very much greater for this modified formulation, 500 times greater after intravenous injection. And over here, we can see that if we sample the splenocytes, and look at transfection of the splenocytes, we see that we're transfecting dendritic cells and macrophages with the MIPS formulation, with our formulation, to a much greater extent, 50 to 100 times higher levels of transfection. And that actually correlates with um, immune responses to a model vaccine like albumin. So if we use an albumin, mRNA instead of nanoluciferase, and then look at uh, an experiment for, say, um, in vivo cytotoxic T cell killing, targeting uh, overcoated splenocytes, we can see that um, the MIPS formulation is much more effective uh, at raising an in vivo CTL response than the standard LMP at this 10 microgram dose. So there's a correlation between expression in splenocytes and response, um, CTL responses generated. And this just shows here that um, this is also true for an intramuscular injection, which is obviously more relevant to the vaccines we're working on now. So here we can see that, um, again, looking across the various tissues, not a great deal of difference between them. But here, the spleen has much higher levels um, in the modified formulation than the standard formulation. Something to do with the arrival of the LNP in the spleen and its ability to get into dendritic cells and macrophages. We've used that kind of strategy to make COVID-19 vaccines. Um, and what we are working on at the moment is a strategy of 
I suppose, a second generation strategy of vaccinating against um, variants of concern, but using just the RBD. So um, we're obviously all very familiar by now, the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, and the RBD is a small part of that spike protein shown in green here. This is the area that we want to raise antibodies against. And so we're vaccinating with essentially just the RBD. We believe that in a variant, the key things that matter in terms of neutralization are the fact that this RBD has been modified in the, in the variants. So we think that um, the problem with making vaccines using variant vaccine using whole spike is that we're primed to raise non-neutralizing antibodies against other epitopes in the spike. And actually what we want is new antibodies against the variant RBD. So our strategy is to try and optimize the induction of new antibodies against the variants rather than, if you like, the problem of running into the, the problem of the original antigenic sin where you've already primed the patient with to make antibodies against the, the parts that don't really matter. So we can make a vaccine in this way using an RBD strategy. And what you can see here is an RBD using the Wuhan sequence. And we've got different doses here in mice, 10, three, and one microgram, good antibody, good, good neutralization against the Wuhan virus here. But when we look at the beta variant virus, we can see that the neutralization is maybe, um, this is the same, same mice, same sera. The neutralization of the beta variant is maybe an order of magnitude lower. Nevertheless, um, in a challenge test in mice challenged with 501Y, it's not the alpha variant, but it's a 501Y isolate that was isolated in Melbourne in the very first wave. These infect, this variant infects mice, and you can see that uh, we can reduce the titer in the lungs down to limit the limit of detection using, that's these mice challenged with that 501Y virus uh, as opposed to the control mice. And here we can see, um, just finishing off really, that um, if we make a beta RBD vaccine, which is what we're making now, that we can raise a good antibody response at very low doses in mice. And we can see a very good dose response this is day 21 after the first dose. And here we see day 21. Uh, this day 21, um, ELISA against the Wuhan RBD, but here day 21, Sera and ELISA against the triple variant beta RBD. And so what we can see here is that the titers are higher against the beta RBD, showing that um, the variant vaccine is raising more antibodies against its target and is relatively lower activity against the Wuhan. So it works in reverse with the beta RBT is maybe tenfold lower uh, and protecting against Wuhan. That sort of indicates that where we are with the beta variants, that it is, it is not so well protected by Wuhan vaccines, but we perhaps will be able to protect with an RBD which is aimed at displaying the beta, the beta RBD. So in the interest of time, I'm going to stop there and just say that um, I'm very grateful for my team has been involved in working on this COVID-19 vaccine, Harry, Stell, Usaka, and Ton. And also want to be want to um, acknowledge Damien Purcell, who's done the micro-neutralization assays for us uh, at the Doherty Institute at the University of Melbourne. Well, that's the end of my talk. Um, I hope that was useful and it's been a pleasure to talk to you.